All right. Thanks, Asma. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, so li like Asma said, my, my name is Nuan Dias. I work as, a, as the director of API architecture at WSO2. I've been around in the company for, for close to seven years now. I started off with uh, being in the ESB team for about one and a half years and then transitioned on to the API manager team. And I've been st stuck there since. So that's about me. And today I'll be talking about APIs and microservices. Basically, what I'll be trying to do is to uh, cover the role of APIs and uh, the, the role they play in a microservices uh, architecture. Um, so to begin with, uh, I'd like to uh, talk about why we need mic uh, why microservices in the first place. So to explain that, I'll use a, a, a monolithic application of um, of an e-commerce of uh, e-commerce system. So if you look at a, a, a traditional monolithic application, um, it'll have uh, it'll have various functions all bundled in, into a single execution runtime. So an e-commerce app probably would have like a function to browse your product catalog, to make orders, uh, uh, separate functions for checking your inventory, uh, separate function for doing shipping, likewise. So typically, all of this will be bundled into a single execution runtime. The, the problem with this model is that it does not really give us the agility we need to meet the new business requirements. Right? So the new business requirements are demanding much more faster pace of innovation much more faster pace of going into production, likewise. So in this type of application, if you wanted to do a single change, for example, in the inventory function, for example, you'd have to compile the entire application and redeploy. Now, when you do that, that's lots of risk involved because you have to now not just test your inventory function, but also the rest of it because you are effectively compiling the entire application. Um, and if you wanted to load balance this type of, of an application, what you do is basically you uh, deploy another instance of it and then load balance it um, uh, through your load balancer. That's how you scale those type of applications. You scale the entire application itself. Um, so, so these problems that I just talked about related to agility was what made the need of microservices arise. So, uh, if, I, if I were to talk a little bit about the characteristics of microservices that solve these problems, uh, as Martin Fowler explains, uh, one of the first characteristics is componentization. So he, he explains that uh, in a, mic a microservice should be designed in such a way that the, the, the logical functions that have uh, similar cohesion should be brought into a single component. So the reason for this, uh, the, the single component is that so that you can independently develop, independently test, and independently deploy that particular component without impacting any other components in your system. So that's one of the key characteristics of a microservice. And also, in respect to organizing these components, what he explains is that these should be organized in such a way by looking at the business functionality and not on the technical background. So for example, if you have a set of functions that are operating on, uh, on your product catalog, for, you should uh, take all those functions and build it into a single microservice with a few functions. Right? So your product, uh, your product um, process and your order process may be on the same technology stack. But just because they are on the same technology stack, for example, just assume that they are both uh, Java applications, just because they are on the same technology stack doesn't mean you should put them into a single microservice. Instead, what you, you should do is think of it from a business point of view, and whatever makes a, a, a business unit or a business functionality cohesive, you put it into a single microservice and deploy. And also, he emphasizes on the fact of single pre uh, responsibility uh, principle, where he says that a microservice should do one thing and one thing uh, only. So that is, again, to eliminate the risk of other stuff breaking when you ch do a, a change to a particular function. And also smart endpoints and dump pipes. So I'm pretty sure everyone in the room has worked with ESBs. Has everyone worked with ESBs? Yeah, so almost everyone knows about ESBs. So ESBs, if you, um, um, if, you, if you think about it, the ESB is a pattern of where there's a single intelligence uh, in, uh, agent who instructs the services what to do. The services themselves are 
somewhat dumb. They operate on when they receive a request, they operate uh, based on the input parameters they receive. It's the ESB who orchestrates among the system, saying you do this, you do this, and you do this. Uh, the, the microservices pattern uh, promotes the inverse of this, saying there should not be a single entity of intelligence, but rather the endpoints themselves should know how to work. So for example, if, if, uh, if, if you're processing an order, an order needs to go and update your inventory, and or, an order needs to go and uh, talk to your uh, shipping service to do the shipping. So in an ESB pattern, it would be the ESB which is telling you make the order, you up the in inventory, and you do the shipping. But in the microservices pattern, the order process itself would take care of all of that without a single intelligence agent. So that's basically about uh, smart endpoints and dump pipes. And he also mandates CI, CD. So if you think about the, the, the topics on the top, or the points on the top, you will realize that as soon as you get into this, you'll end up with lots of services and lots of interactions between those services. So unless you have a very well-defined CI, CD pipeline, a very well-executable CI, CD pipeline, you are going to end up in a big mess. So if you're going in for microservices, defining this pipeline is absolutely important. Of course, it's manageable if you have just 10 services. But you go more than that, you have to have this very clearly defined pipeline. So why do I emphasize on this? That's because we are here to talk about the role of APIs in a microservice architecture. So we need to very clearly remember that even when we are doing this, we have to stick to these characteristics. So I've seen many an instance where when people say we do microservices, what they simply do is they, they remove an ESB and replace it with an API gateway. So that doesn't give you a microservice functionality. Just because you remove an ESB, just because you remove an orchestrator and move that, uh, give that responsibility to an API gateway, it doesn't mean you have gotten rid of all the orchestration in the system. Right? So we have to be very careful and think about these characteristics and adhere to them when designing our architecture. So taking the same example of above uh, that I talked about before, and if you convert it into a microservice architecture, this is probably what you will end up with. So you'll have an order uh, microservice, inventory, orders, and shipping microservices. So at first glance, you will realize that this has a certain uh, element of chaos in the system. Now you have lots of interactions, and this is just about four microservices, and imagine having hundreds of them, right? So the, the client application, if it wants to get and you know, browse your uh, product catalog, it will talk to the products microservice. Uh, if it wants to make an order, it will talk to the order microservice likewise. And if the order microservice for it to complete, it needs to know how to talk to the inventory microservice and how to talk to the shipping microservice, likewise. So there's a certain level of chaos in this system, right? So and this is a problem we are trying to solve by bringing in APIs into the picture. This is why APIs are important in your microservice architecture. So first up, what you, the, the, the problem uh, that we talked about is related to exposure. So all of these interactions, the, the reason they become chaotic is because they are not organized properly. Their exposure is not organized properly. So you bring in an API gateway, and you deal with the exposure problem. So what you do there is basically you uh, bring in a single uh, entity, which, which basically exposes all of your services in a uniform manner. So Nuan, in the previous talk, was talking about how uh, each individual team would be developing their own microservices. So when they do that, so assume, for example, you have team one building the products microservice, team two building the orders microservice. They can be two different technologies. They can have their own standards, right? So when they develop like that, chances are that you'll not end up with a uniform interface. Now, when that happens, exposing this to the outside becomes a big trouble because your consumers are now going to get confused because you talk to one microservice in another way and another microservice in another way. But bringing in a gateway, you can expose all of these in a uniform fashion. So that's one of the advantages that we can gain through, uh, through an API gateway. And also, uh, with regard to inter-service communication, now we talked about uh, the order service having to know about the inventory service, right? But if the inventory service is going through various life cycles, 
uh, it becomes a problem for the order service to talk to it. But instead, if the order service talks to the inventory through a gateway, then there you get a uniform interface and things don't change. You can basically use that to communicate. So similarly, there are different advantages by bringing in an API gateway to solve this problem of exposure. Like I explained, uniformity. So you may have heterogeneous services, but through a gateway, you can ensure uniformity. And also discovery, like if the order service wants to find the inventory service, all it needs to do is to talk to the relevant endpoint on the gateway. And also defining security boundaries. So it could also be that your shipping service is a third party service that needs a, that is enclosed in a separate security domain, right? So if your client application is talking to, a, to the order service, there should be someone who's managing the security context between these perimeters. So the gateway is also a component that is capable of doing that. And also policy enforcement. We talked about the single uh, responsibility rule, right? And a microservice is supposed to focus on its business logic. But uh, we also need to enforce policies for access control rate limiting likewise. So if you're if you not doing it at the microservice level because of the single responsibility rule, there needs to be someone who is doing it for them. And that would typically be the gateway. Uh, same rule applies to uh, business value reporting. So if the microservices themselves are not doing business value reporting, you can use the gateway to do the business value reporting of those uh, microservices. So that's one of the problems it solves. And also, when you're transitioning your monolith into a microservice architecture, now this is an exercise that we all know would take a lot of time, right? Uh, this transition will take time. It will break all your consumers. Likewise, so how do you deal with transitioning your monolith into a microservice architecture? The first step would be to expose your entire monolith through a well-defined interface on the gateway. So first you expose your monolith through a gateway, through a standard interface, and get your clients to work on the gateway. And after you establish that, then you start to slowly decompose your monolith into microservices. So as, as you see in this picture, you can start by first moving the product a function into a separate microservice. Uh, so, uh, so there will be lots of changes happening in the background, but your consumers won't even know about it because they deal with a well-defined standard interface uh, called the gateway. Right? So this is, yet again, another problem uh, that we can solve using this uh, pattern. So when you, in, in the transition phase, there could be uh, some cases where you need to do a certain level of orchestration at the gateway. Because we are right now in a transition phase. We are not entirely microservices, and we are not entirely monolith, so we are in the middle. So this can be an exception for the orchestration scenario. I mentioned before that we should not do any kind of like single entry orchestration anymore. But this can be an exception because we are in a transition phase. Uh, it's again based on the use case and, and the type of scenarios we have to deal with. Uh, another benefit that the gateway brings in is when you want to do um, deployment. So, uh, so we talked about fast iteration and all of that. So we, you will be having different versions of your microservice at different times. So if you have v1, version 1 of your microservice today and version 2 of your microservice tomorrow, you need to route all your traffic to the new service, but you also at the same time don't want to decommission your old version because you don't know when something will go wrong. So to deal with these kinds of problems, there are various uh, deployment uh, rules or patterns. Blue-green is one of them. So what you can do is you can get the gateway to route all of your traffic to the new version, and you observe whether something is going wrong. And if it is, you immediately switch back to the older version. So your clients won't know anything about this, and you can immediately fall back with minimal uh, impact to the business. So the same pattern applies to canary deployments as well. In the cases, case of canary deployments, what happens is you route a small percentage of your traffic to the new version and slowly keep incre increasing that percentage while reducing the percentage on your uh, older version. And if something goes wrong, you immediately revert what you do. And eventually, you end up with routing 100% of your traffic to the new version and uh, you can uh, decommission your older version once you're comfortable. So that's, again, another benefit that you can get with an API gateway pattern in a microservice architecture. And also load balancing and discovery. The gateway itself can act as a load balancer. 
So uh, we usually expose all of our services through a dedicated load balancer, but the gateway itself can act um, as a load balancer. And in addition to that, so when you have lots of microservices, and when they are being rapidly developed by your teams, their IPs and addresses will keep changing rapidly. So uh, the gateway will need the assistance of registry services, such as you know, ETCD or console, to discover your backend systems. So the gateway will have integrations to these kinds of systems to uh, discover your backends and uh, route traffic among them. So when you deploy an API gateway in your microservice architecture, you are adding another hop to your um, network layer. So that doesn't, that sometimes might not be very good because of the latency concerns. So we should think of ways of optimizing the impact of this additional network hop. And one of the ways to do that is to deploy your gateway as close to your microservice as much as possible. So that way you minimize the latency impact on your microservice. So you can do this by uh, deploying these gateways closer to your microservices, um, uh, closer to your microservice. And similarly, uh, you may have scenarios where you want to expose the same service to different type of clients. For example, the products microservice um, may give you a huge product catalog for your web application. But if the same microservice is being consumed by your mobile application, you don't need all of that data because you can't render it on your application. So how do you optimize that? You can optimize that by having a separate uh, gateway for these two types of clients. So you can have a mobile gateway and a web gateway. And at the gateway, you can optimize the data that, that is being given to the different types of clients. So this is, yet again, another uh, optimization that we can think about. So if you noticed, we are now slowly moving from a central gateway model to a distributed gateway model. Where and this is what we call, and this, this is basically the reason for the micro gateway pattern to image, uh, emerge. So uh, we are basically decomposing our gateways into smaller units so that they can be optimized by client and deployed uh, closer to our services and do various forms of other optimization possible. So we just yesterday launched uh, version 2.5 of our API manager. And uh, um, along with that, we released uh, a brand new micro gateway. So I won't go into the details of this very much right now, because we have a session right after lunch, uh, which talks about the nuts and bolts of how the micro gateway all works. I'll try to cover the design aspects of it. So the micro gateway is designed to scale. It does not have any links to external components. It can, in theory, scale indefinitely. And it has native support for containers and container orchestration systems, like Docker and Kubernetes. It has a mode of called private jet, where you can deploy a, a gateway per microservice. And it has first class support for lifecycle management across environments, where you can program the micro gateway 100% using environment variables and stuff like that. So to give you a quick overview, what we have is something called the Micro Gateway Toolkit, which connects to a central API management system, downloads one or more API definitions into it based on the input you provide, and compiles a gateway runtime. So this gateway runtime can be of different forms. Uh, so what it basically does is to compile this runtime. And when it comes to the security architecture of it, it supports this mode of uh, signed JWT validation. So if your client application talks to the API manager and gets a token, or, or an STS and gets a token, that the API manager is capable of issuing a signed JWT which contains all of the information required for the gateway to do authentication and authorization. So your app will then send this token to the micro gateway. And the micro gateway doesn't need any assistance from any other components in the system to do the validation. It has no links to outside and therefore can scale uh, indefinitely. But of course, we have to think about backward compatibility of applications. So it also does support the old standard OAuth 2 mode, where when it receives an OAuth token, it can talk to the STS or the uh, API manager and do the validation. And rate limiting is also embedded into the 
micro gateway itself. So if you're someone who's familiar with the API manager already, you may have heard about the traffic manager and how the gateway communicates with the traffic manager and all of that. But in this case, when you compile or when you build the micro gateway, all your rate limiting policies are embedded into it. So to do rate limiting, it doesn't have to talk to any other external components. Same analogy for analytics. So uh, the, the metadata of your APIs, of your API requests, are all um, accumulated in the local file system of the micro gateway, and then offloaded, uh, uploaded offline into an analytics engine. So this upload process is a, is a separate process. It can be within the micro gateway itself or even as a separate process. Uh, so if it, if it is within the micro gateway, it may need a connection to the analytics engine on and off, not continuous, to do the upload. But if it's a separate process, it doesn't uh, need a connection to the analytics engine at all. So therefore, the micro gateway, like I said, is designed to scale. And you don't have to worry about the rest of the uh, components in the system. Uh, so I, in the beginning, I, uh, when introducing the micro gateway, I told you that its runtime can be of different forms. So these are the forms that are available right now. Uh, if you just do a default compilation, you get a micro gateway uh, VM, which has you know a bash script that you can uh, start and run. So distribution size size is about 40 megabytes, uh, so you can just uh, uh, run it. And if you provide the correct input parameters to the build phase, you can get a Docker image out of it uh, in the build phase itself. So you can commit, your push your Docker image into your registries and use it anywhere you want. Same for Kubernetes uh, artifacts. So if you provide the correct configurations in the build phase, you can get the relevant Kubernetes uh, artifacts that you can use in your uh, deployment orchestration systems, container orchestration systems. Uh, so I also said it has first class support for lifecycle management. So you may compile your micro gateway in your development environment, and you may want to use that exact binary in your upper environments for various purposes. So, and when you do that, you basically want to rewire into your backend systems, backend URLs, backend credentials, um, and things like that. So uh, this supports reprogramming those. Uh, connections via environment variables. So you can basically um, provide them as environment variables and reconfigure your uh, runtime in, in the other environments that you, that you have. So, so Paul yesterday and uh, Tyler too in their key keynotes touched upon this cell-based architecture model. And Asank, uh, who is from our CTO office, is having a detailed session on the cell-based architecture just after lunch in the architecture track. So I thought I'd, uh, I'd touch upon where this gateway fits in in this cell-based architecture. So if you want more detail about this cell-based architecture, you should probably attend that session. But uh, a cell is basically a, a logical grouping of uh, microservice pods. So there can be different microservice pods. Uh, and a cell is basically a logical enclosure of it. So where the gateway fits in in a, in a typical cell-based architecture is that the gateway would act as the single or the first entry point into your cell. So all of your services within the particular microservices within the cell would be exposed via a single gateway per cell. So that would be the role that the gateway plays in a cell-based architecture. So we also have sidecars that sit along uh, with the pods. So the small boxes in orange within those pods are the sidecars. Sidecars could be service meshes or even like micro gateways based on how you design it. So the inter-service communication would happen uh, uh, among themselves, not through the central gateway, but among themselves. So if you're interested in learning more about this, you should attend that session. But I just wanted to place in your heads where the, the role an API gateway would play uh, in this kind of an architecture. And if you played around with you know, service measures, if you read about them, you would have noticed that the service mesh tries to do the exact the same thing that an API gateway does, which is true. right? So there's when you compare feature functionality, there's lots of overlap between what gateways does and what service measures do. But service measures are primarily targeted toward the network communications infrastructure. They don't deal with the exposure layer of it. So if you map this again to a cell-based architecture, you would have uh, 
uh, inter-service communication that is happening through service mesh sidecars. So if you have port 1 talking with port 2, that communication will happen with the sidecar in the particular port. So uh, that is the level of communication that service measures offer you. But then there's a higher level of exposure, which is where you expose your services to the outer world, to external consumers and to other applications. That exposure happens at an, at an API gateway layer. So if you're confused about uh, uh, which one to use and where to use and when to use it, so this is the basic uh, understanding that I have that all of your exposure, discovery, and all of that are all handled by an ex uh, API gateway layer, whereas the inter-service, inter-communication uh, within the microservices happens through service mesh sidecars. So uh, these sidecars are basically managed through like uh, um, the control plane in the service mesh. So if you're familiar with Istio, for example, uh, the, the sidecar would be the envoy proxy. And whereas you have this two control plane, which governs all the policies and stuff uh, in those sidecars. Um, <clears throat> so I, uh, to, to end up, I want to touch upon a little bit about the future. So I talked about smart endpoints uh, and dump pipes. So you all know the, the difference between a ballet and an orchestra, right? So in an orchestra, you have a central person who is telling the musicians what to do, which instrument to play, and when to play. Uh, a ballet is kind of different, right? So you have the dancers listening to the music, and what they, there's no central person t telling them which steps to take. What they do is they, they listen to the music, and they uh, change their steps based on when the music changes, based on the tune. So they are aware of what's happening in the environment, and they react to it. So this is the uh, uh, eventual. This is this is the eventual state of smart endpoints and dump pipes. This is where we want to get to eventually a, a system where uh, each microservice or each component listens to its environment and reacts to the changes in the environment, just like the ballet dancers do, right? So we talked about uh, an API gateway being something like this, but if you recall, we talked about when the order service needs to talk to the um, inventory service, the order service needs to know that it has to talk to the inventory service, which means there's still a link between the order service and inventory service. So we want to get to a state where the order service does not even talk to an inventory service. The order service just emits an event saying, I processed an order and whoever is interested in that event can listen to it and react based on that. So basically, the order service will not know anything about an inventory service. It, uh, those two operations happen completely asynchronously. So that is a state that we want to uh, get to in the future. Of course, you need to de deal with the resiliency and the uh, failures and all of that, and all those complications are there. So this is uh, where we want to get to. Uh, eventually. So that's it from me uh, this morning. I hope it has been uh, uh, an interesting session for you, and I hope I've been able to put something in your mind, clear your doubts on, on APIs and the role they play uh, in a typical microservice architecture. So thank you, everyone. I'll, I'll be around. So if you have any questions, you can meet me uh, today or even tomorrow, and we can have a chat. Thank you.